We're going to begin right now. Mama Nokichi is coming with the historical tribute. And uh, she is about black power. She is a black lawyer. As a matter of fact, she wrote a book called Black Power, Black Lawyer, My Audacious Quest for Justice. She's coming with, an, a, with a piece on justice and giving us, the putting things in historical perspective for us today. Mama Nokichi, will you come and bring us the historical tribute now? We are men. We are not beasts, and we do not intend to be beaten or driven as such. The entire prison populace, that means each and every one of us here, have set forth to change forever the ruthless brutalization and disregard for the lives of the prisoners here and throughout the United States. What has happened here is but the sound before the fury of those who are oppressed. Those were the words read by Elliot L. D. Barclay on September 9, 1971, to seek to bring light to their treacherous experiences at New York State's Attica State Prison. Elliot L. D. Barclay, his name is one that should be shouted out, honored and revered, like that of George Jackson, Jonathan Jackson, Fred Hampton. We are talking about a brave 21-year-old brother who was days away from his scheduled release date and who was the epitome of the statement, one is not free until all of us are free. A man who spoke truth to power. We need to remember his name, Elliot. L.D. Barclay. My historical tribute this morning is dedicated to the memory of those who valiantly seized the moment and fought for their human rights against horrific odds, yet needlessly perished due to state retaliation on the day of September 13th, 1971. Yes, exactly on this very day, 49 years ago. Do you know where you were on that day? I do. I was 16 years old, glued to the six o'clock news on the black and white television screen in my family's living room, watching in horror the images of powerless black men paraded naked through a prison yard after Attica, a prison in upstate New York, is needlessly stormed. I remember vividly how hard it was to hear the TV as torrential rains were beating against the front windows of my family's home, rains that had pummeled the East Coast that week of September 9th through 13th, 1971. That is my memory. Think back to your own. If you were born and of the age and consciousness, where were you and what were you doing when Attica exploded? Many of us know what happened at Attica. Many of us don't. But what is not common knowledge are the events leading up to what the New York State Special Commission on Attica characterizes, quote, the bloodiest one day encounter between Americans since the Civil War. What really happened to Attica? What did the prisoners want? How did the officials react? Who killed whom? Has anything changed since the uprising? 43 prisoners and hostages lay dead after the four day rebellion. Many more were wounded, why? The uprising did not come out of nowhere. In September of 1971, Attica Prison, there were over 2,200 people locked up in a facility built to house 1,600. All the guards but one. All the prison administrators were white. Prisoners at Attica spent 14 to 16 hours a day in their six by nine cells. They got one shower a week, essentially consisting of a bucket of water. In June 1971, Five Attica prisoners established the Attica Liberation Faction to try to bring about some change in the conditions. They started reading and teaching political ideology, Lenin, uh, Marx, Malcolm, Du Bois, others. They had study groups led by prisoners affiliated with the Nation of Islam, the Black Panther Party, the Young Lords, the Five Percenters. They had to get along with all the different factions to become one solid movement. In July, they presented a manifesto of 27 demands to Commissioner of Corrections, Russell Oswald and Governor Nelson Mandela summarized as follows. We demand the constitutional rights of legal representation and parole board hearings. We demand a change in medical staff. There are numerous mistakes made, improper and erroneous medication given by untrained personnel. We demand adequate 
visiting conditions. We demand an end to the segregation of prisoners due to their political beliefs. We demand an end to the punishment of prisoners who practice a constitutional right to peaceful dissent. We demand the right to subscribe to political papers and books. We demand that better food be served, that inmates wishing a pork-free diet should have one. And it went on, 27 detailed demands, nothing radical, but just basic human rights. Commissioner Oswald did not act on those demands. Instead, the warden responded by increasing the frequency of cell searches and censoring all references to prison conditions from news sources. And then George Jackson was killed by correctional officers in San Quentin on uh, August 21st, 1971. His killing sparked protests, including work stoppages at prisons across the country. One of the founders of the Attica faction um, explained it this way. He said, what really solidified things was George Jackson's death. We thought, how can we pay tribute to George Jackson? Because a lot of us idolized him and the things he was doing and the things he was exposing about the system. So we decided that we would have a silent fast that whole day in honor of him. We would wear black armbands. No one was to eat anything that whole day. So on August 22nd, 1971, a hunger strike ensued at Attica in honor of George Jackson. Prisoners marched to the mess hall for breakfast in single file. They sat silently. They refused to eat. Frank, big black Smith, who later uh, uh, on served on the negotiating committee during the September rebellion and protected hostages and observers, yet was later viciously tortured and brutalized by guards. He described the scene on the morning after Jackson's death. He said, I didn't know anything about George Jackson. So when we got to the mess hall that morning, everything was quiet. No one was saying nothing. And you're talking about five, six, 700 people. The unity and the solidarity of the brothers was the epitome of the seven principles, Umoja, Kujichagalia, Ujima, Ujima, Nia, Kumba, and yes, Imani. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore in run? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it explode? Bill, if you could put on the first slide, I would appreciate it. September the 9th, some prisoners subdued a lieutenant and overpowered four guards and locked them in cells. The uprising quickly spread to the other cell blocks with more than 1,200 prisoners congregating in cell block D. Ultimately, 42 correctional officers were taken hostage. Although members of the Attica Liberation Faction did not participate in the initial takeover, as a result of their organized front, they quickly joined in to move the prisoners toward explicit demands for reform. The prisoners formed a committee to negotiate with the commissioner for the release of the hostages, demanded that outside observers be present. It's important to note that the members of the Attica Liberation Front, and specifically the Black Muslims, protected the hostages and were credited with keeping order and the peace during the long, stressful days of the takeover. Let me tell you this. The prisoners were brilliant. They had a collective leadership. They were cohesive. They exercised solidarities. These were their initial demands. We want complete amnesty, meaning freedom from any and all physical, mental, and legal reprisals. We want speedy and safe transportation out of confinement to a non-imperialistic country. And we urgently demand immediate negotiations with listed observers, including attorney William Consular, Huey P. Newton, Tom Wicker, the New York Times, and more, that were, they were guaranteed the safe passage of all people to and from the institution. They said, we want them here to witness this degradation so that they can better know how to bring this degradation to an end. Listen up, my sisters and brothers. These were not mad, crazed prisoners, though they had every right to be. The prisoners were spot on organized. They methodically constructed what I would call departments with essential services, such as medical, food preparation and service, communication, security. We're talking about the necessity to feed and shelter and ensure the basic necessities of over a thousand people. The guards that had been taken hostage were given food first, and there were prisoners assigned to watch over the guards and make sure those prisoners seeking revenge and retaliation for years of abuse against them did not cause them harm. Bill, can you have slide two, please? Rockefeller, however, refused to come to Attica to aid in the negotiations and also refused the prisoners' demand for amnesty. Attorney Bill Kunstler later testified that they had worked out with the prisoners and the commissioner 
several formulas, y'all, for amnesty just hours before the attack. And he said, quote, if we have been allowed to continue, everyone would be alive and the matter would be settled today. But the process was not allowed to continue. Despite the fact that it had been raining steadily for four days, that the prisoners' morale was being worn down, despite the fact the food was running out, and they just might have given in, despite all of those facts, on September 13, 1971, Rockefeller ordered thousands of National Guardsmen, state troopers, and corrections officials to attack the prisoners. Bill, slide three, please. Hundreds of prisoners are shot along with nine of the hostages. They were shot by the stormtroopers. The prisoners had no guns and many of the alleged leaders were selectively marked for assassination. One prisoner said later, quote, it was like a slaughter man. The people were defenseless. They had sticks and homemade weapons to defend themselves, but this doesn't compare man with magnums and carbines. Egregiously, the corrections department said that the Hostages' throats were slashed by the prisoners, a blatant lie. The coroner's report later showed that no hostages died of slashed throats. All died of police gunshot wounds. Despite the humaneness and the restraint shown by the Attica brothers, after the prison was retaken, the men were subjected to extreme cases of brutality and torture, made to strip and crawl on the ground through the muddy yard and forced to run naked between a gauntlet of enraged white officers who tortured and beat them mercilessly with sticks and clubs. Elliot L.D. Barkley was among those murdered, marked for assassination, shot in the back after the surrender. Slide four, please. Naked with hands over their head, the prisoners were forced to walk barefoot on glass, bleeding feet and all. Everyone was abused and beat by gauntlet guards and troopers yelling, run nigger, run white nigger, run Spanish nigger. Some were sexually tortured by guards. They were dumped in cold cells naked. Many had fractures with no medical attention. Last slide, please, Bill. But despite it all, as a result of the heroic stance and sacrifice of the Attica brothers during the uprising for human rights, changes were made throughout the New York state prison system, as well as in prisons across the country. Grievance procedures were instituted. It was the dawning of a new day and mass attention to prison issues. After decades in the courts, the state of New York finally agreed to pay $12 million to the Attica brothers to settle the case. And finally today, as we are in the streets shouting Black Lives Matter, get your knee off our necks. What do we want freedom? When do we want it now? We must never forget the heroic heroism and sacrifice of those from George Jackson to Elliot L.D. Barkley and the roll call of names of human beings that you see on the screen who lost their lives this day, September 13th, nearly 50 years ago. Asante Sana. I say, I say. Wow, I say, oh. Karibu. Oh, mm. what a beautiful uh, recollection of those events at Attica. Uh, thank you, Mama Nokichi, for doing that. A beautiful presentation, beautiful coordination with Brother Bill and the slides. Oh. Um, we need to we need to re research that. We need to look at that independently for ourselves and never forget. Thank you, thank you, Asante Sana, Madasi, Mama Nokichi. And now, more music to come from the sounds of Maat and David and Latrice. Lift us up, and then the next words that we will hear will be from our Minister of the Day. Minister Malley will come and give us the message. All right. Excuse me. We'll have we'll have the litany of sacrifice after the song, and then uh, Minister Malley. Brother David. Okay. Here we are, Bob. All right. Cool. <laughs> You are, you are. 
Beautiful and soothing for us today and now. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Mama Connie and Baba Sydney will come forward with the litany of sacrifice. Give thanks. Ah, Shay. Shay. Well, good morning. Uh, still is morning. Good morning to uh, we'll say family. This has been a powerful, powerful service to me. It has really been moving from the uh, the initial. Uh, uh, a uh, libation that was given by uh, Minister Makalusi, who always pours and gives such a powerful libation to uh, uh, Sister Rana. That was so heartfelt. I, I really, really touched me and it moved. And I felt the power of the collective standing around. And she says, you know, bring your, bring, bring your problems, bring your, your, the weight of what's on your heart to the middle of the circle, lay it down and let us work collectively to solve that, I she and the, the 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 litany of sacrifice. I mean, not the litany of sacrifice, but the historical tribute by 
my mama Nikichi, that was so spot on. It has just been rolling. And the music by by the sounds of Maat, uh, 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 the Pharaoh Saunders, uh, a master plan. And then, as David may know, as some of you, I mean, six eight is just my most powerful, my the, my favorite rhythm. It just really does touch it. So I I love when the brother comes out with that six eight all the time. So it has been really really moving. And now it is that time in our service where um, we, we need to actually support all of this that is going around, that we have no, no grants, that we actually are the ones who, who pay for all of this. And we have on the screen um, where you might make your contributions. We have Wose Oakland and we have Wose uh, Sacramento and that we need one another. We need to pay for this. We need to support one another by our hard work. Uh, there's a passage in the Husea. It's from the book of, uh, of Febhor, uh, page 69, that I choose to read from. And it says, those who give food generously when they have money are the ones to whom fate gives fortune. For wealth goes to those who give food to others by means of it. The heart of God is satisfied when the poor stand provided for before him. Thus, if you acquire property, give a portion to God by giving a portion to the poor. If you acquire property, spend it on your own town so there will be no turmoil in it. If you, if it is in your power, invite those far away as well as those near, for those who invite those from afar, their names will be great when they go afar. Those who love their neighbors will find a family around them. God allows one to acquire wealth in return for doing good. And those who give food to the poor, God takes them himself in mercy without measure. I shake the reading of the Husea. Uh, now it is time to, we will go through the litany of sacrifice and we ask that uh, you read along with us uh, quietly on mute uh, and participate in this um, portion of our, our, of our litany of sacrifice. It says, Save us, O Holy One, by your name, Vindicate us by your might. Hear my prayer. Divine protector, listen to the words of my mouth. How can we repay the Holy One for the gifts that have been given to us? We will lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the God of our ancestors. We will fulfill our vows to our creator in the presence of all our people gladly we bring our sacrifices to you. We will praise your name, O Amun-Ra, for it is good. Umoja, unity. We shall strive to maintain unity in the family, community, nation, and race. Kujichagalia, self-determination. We shall define, name, create, and speak for ourselves. Ujima, collective work and responsibility. We shall build and maintain our communities together. Our brothers' and sisters' problems shall be ours to solve together. Ujamaa, cooperative economics. Together we shall build and maintain our own businesses and together profit from them. Nia, purpose. We shall make our collective vocation the building and developing of our community and the restor restoration of our people to our traditional greatness. Kumba, creativity. We shall do as much as we can in any way that we can, any way we can, to leave our community more beautiful and beneficial than when we inherited it. And together, Imani, faith. We will believe with all our hearts in our God, our people, and, and the, the righteousness, righteousness and victory of, of our, our struggle. struggle. I'm in Ra. I see. 
And now we will uh, offer up a prayer. And I would like to roll, think back a little bit, just go back a little bit to the prayer offered by uh, Sister Rana, where she says that, and, and I think Minister uh, uh, Imhotep had mentioned something that Fannie Lou Hamer uh, uh, said, which is that you have to put some work into your prayer. We have to put work into what we believe in. We have to put work into supporting what it is that we do. It takes more than just to, um, just to pray or to say that I support you and not put on any work. And I think metaphorically speaking, prayer is much like, and giving is much like the wheel, the invention of the wheel, which revolutionized uh, during that time, you were able to create and build such great things as the pyramid and ir irrigation systems by the way. A pyramid, unless you put work into it, I say that you have to put work, prayer into it and something behind it, not just pray that it gets well but we have to put work into it. And as we try and build and grow, we'll say much like the pyramids that it would last for a long Bob Sydney has frozen. But I think what he was saying is that you have to work at it, that you have to not only uh, give with words, but give with deeds. Uh, as an example, in the Medunetur of ancient Kemet, the gift, Technical the gift for love is a farm. You hear me now? Yes, yes, come back in, sir, yes. You seem to be having some type of, of difficulty, so we'll, I'll, I'll just take it from here and just continue on. That glyph for love is a hoe or a farming tool, which says to me, in order to love, to show love, you have to work at it. And particularly African people. If you're going to love our people, you're going to have to work at it. And so everybody has to work. Everybody has to sacrifice. And when we're working together, we are actually doing God's work. We're doing the work of the Creator. So give thanks and praise for all of you that are able to contribute today. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Divine and Dweller of every heart and mind, we thank you for uh, this offering that is given to us freely. We ask that you would bless and uh, and, and touch each one that was able to give today. And we ask that you would bless each one that wanted to give today that wasn't able to. We ask that you would multiply this offering uh, a thousandfold and multiply our wisdom, knowledge, and understanding on how to invest it and to uh, direct it wisely. We ask that you would uh, lift up uh, Eli Omade. We ask that you would lift up Wose Oakland, lift up Wose Sacramento, lift up our uh, people that are working diligently to restore ourselves to our traditional greatness. Lead us from the unreal to the real. Lead us from darkness to light and lead us from mortality to immortality. For you are the imperishable one. You are the changeless reality. You are the source of all life. These are other blessings we ask in your most precious name. Let us all say together, Amen. Amen. Ashe. Amen. Ashe. Amen. Ashe. Ashe. Amen. Ra. All right, and now we are, we have been waiting for this special moment for my brethren. Yes, we are homies. We're from West Oakland. We have that experience together. We have a family connection together. Give thanks. We're going, we're preparing to hear this uh, magnificent message from the heart, from the creator, through the person of Minister Mali Latham. Brother, will you come and lift us up 
in your message today? With the permission of our ancestors and the elders and with all the divine entities that oversee us, I want to, one, express thanks for the opportunity to share a message. I also want to mention uh, uh, thank you to Minister Hotep for the precious gift that he gave uh, during the meditation period. I was uh, sparked and, and I will be doing some follow-up research to address that information, particularly around the Greek text, which I have had an opportunity to look at before. And also with the Ankh, uh, the information was new for me and I am uh, pleased and excited with the, the looking forward to that research to address that. So thank you, Minister Hotep. And for oh, those of you who don't come to the med meditation, those are some of the gifts you might miss. So you might want to come and be there. Uh, yeah. I uh, want to first pray that the message lifts us up, that the message will bring sunlight in what appears to be darkness and dark clouds and dreariness, that the message will touch and heal and will move folks in times where it appears to be unmovable in sadness and stress. I pray that one, that we will also achieve that calm that calm that was spoken to and mentioned about the Hesea, a calm that will keep the temple in place and will also hold those who are in the temple. Aman, amen. Amen. This afternoon, I, I, I have an observation that I want to share with folks. It seems a amazing to me that in this time when there is the pandemic and all these other issues, uh, tremendous numbers of folks unemployed and economic insecurity and these uh, social political struggles, that there seems to be a missing input or a voice from the arena of those folks who consider themselves religious leaders. And the church house seems to be quite quiet, uh, at least in the media and in public formats, when it comes to addressing these issues, these, these struggles, these obstacles. Something seemingly on such a large level, there would be some black pastors and some church leaders and some evangelical reverends that would be standing up and speaking up. I believe that there's a difficulty in that because there's a difference between religiosity and spirituality. Yes, yes. See, with religiosity, yes, yes. there's going to be a struggle when it comes to times like these. Um, when you've been taught or led to believe that because you are better than or because you are loyal to a particular deity or because you are such a, a good and holy person that nothing bad should happen to you. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And when you've been taught in your from childhood to adulthood that uh, all you got to do is pray and things will automatically get better, it becomes difficult with religiosity to hold on to that position when you could go to a church house and get infected with a disease that ain't cured, that gets people sick, and they die. Well, no matter what their religion is, no matter what their holiness is, no matter how good they may behave. And then spirituality has a different perspective. And I believe that it comes for us folks, particularly those of us in the Will State community, spirituality has to be based that Afrocentric, African-centered philosophy values, morals, and principles. If we're not centered in those things, then times like these might begin to be difficult. And I would also say that there is a big difference between those of us who may be centered in African-centered philosophy and those who are in Eurocentric belief systems. That struggle, that conflict 
uh, is exemplified by our approach to handling these issues that have been emphasized or magnified these days. My message today, I believe, will address or help us to fortify ourselves in our Afro African centered belief systems. My title of the message is Letting Go of Elmers. That might sound a bit strange. Who is that Elmer? And what is he talking about? Well, I don't know how many of you uh, are familiar with Elmer's glue, but there's a condition that I came into contact with when I had the opportunity to attend a convention that uh, Bishop, Bishop Desmond Tutu and our brother spoke at. Bishop Desmond Tutu was the featured keynote speaker, but the thing that touched me really even more than what he had to say was the speech given by a brother named John Diamba. And in that speech, he spoke about the Elmer's condition. Now, for those of you who may be younger, Elmer's was a, a glue, is a glue, a white, thick glue. It's so popular that even these days, it's standard issue in many uh, learning institutions and schools. Elmer's and the Elmer's condition, John Diama suggested, interfere with black unity, with folks of African heritage of coming together and working together in a successful manner. What is this Elmer's condition? Well, he said that many times things that are African-based, things that are African-centered are devalued or not validated unless there's some white folks in it. Either there's white approval of it, white engagement of it, or white participants in it. And without the Elmer's that is involved in it, then even there are some black folks who yes. don't value it. Yes. I hate to be the one to tell you, <laughs> but I'm going to say, yes, even for our own folks. Oh. We tend to not think something is powerful and mm -hmm. positive unless we can point to some white validation, either by those in the media who say, oh, we, that's such a righteous thing, or if actual white folks sitting amongst us or being involved in it in some manner. And if you don't believe that is true, well, let me give you a great example going on today. The Black Lives Matters movement. Uh -huh. In case you didn't know, Black Lives Matters movement did not start this year. All right. And it didn't start with Coley Kaepernick kneeling on the football field. Mm. The Black Lives Matters movement began when three sisters got together yeah. during the Trayvon Martin trial, mm. that once he was killed and murdered and Zimmerman was acquitted, these sisters believed that we needed to address this ongoing oppression, particularly at the hands of police, but also in just regular everyday white folks. And that this ain't new news, but it's actually ongoing news about our condition in this country. And that is actually the birth of the Black Lives Matters movement. Tell us, tell us. Yet, what was the reaction back then? Uh-huh. Even when Colin Kaepernick, a, a football athlete, kneeled, didn't uh, raise up no guns, didn't run across the field and interrupt the play, he was vilified. Folks, even within the sport, at first, at first it was a few folks that joined hands and kneeled a little bit, but even on his own football team, there was only one player, Eric Reed, that continued to kneel with him. Yes. And by the end of the season, most of the athletes were moving on, moved on so well that they were able to pay a number of them some money so they wouldn't continue those protests. And even your president got up and called those people kneeling, sons of bitches, named them, 
and insulted them. Mm. Now today, ooh we now yeah. media is just so proud of the Black Lives Matters movement. Yeah. And guess what even some black folks have said? They are so thinking that it's much more meaningful, that it's much more effective because there are white folks now engaged in supporting it. That white folks are actually standing out in being in the marches. So is that to suggest that until white folks approve of it or that since there were only black folks, seemingly the majority of people in the marches, that it had no value? Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Right. So, as I said, even today, we struggle with the Elmer's condition. And I don't think that means we're, uh, we have a lost cause or that we're not going to become more unified and effective. But I do have uh, some suggestions about how to address and let go of the Elmers. Can we speak about that this morning? Let's go ahead, go ahead. Uh, I'm going to use as a format or a uh, foundation of that solution, a story. A story um, that comes from the Ashanti tradition that is called the Anansi story. All right. Um, many uh, folks that may have heard of Anansi, last week we were, uh, there was, Sister Denisha was talking about the Twi language, which comes from the Ashanti people. And the Ashanti people were mainly populated in Southeast Ghana. And the Anansi folklore was so great, and it spread through Nigeria, other parts of the West, all the way across the Atlantic into the Caribbean, where a Nazi is known as Miss Nancy or Nancy or Aunt Anansi. All right, all right, give us the history. This folklore that is powerful African wisdom tends to get belittled or judged as paganism and other stories when it comes into contact with Eurocentric belief systems. Yet we know that a Nazi carries a powerful wisdom and message for us. So I want to use the Nazi story to address this issue about the Elmer's condition. This particular story, which is uh, one of many, when it comes to talking about folklore, uh, whether it is uh, the Aesop fables in Greece, who happens to also be a black man, or it's the it's <laughs> Br'er Rabbit stories in the South. All right. Or even the Shine stories of Dolomite. Mm. There's always this character, the trickster, uh. who is quite popular and very common. And it's a, also a spiritual character because this person doesn't depend on its own strength to be successful. This character uses wisdom and knowledge to outwit his opponents, which is a spiritual aspect. And we'll talk about that more a little bit later. The story a Nazi in this particular situation is where a Nazi has a family. He has a wife and he has five sons. And as each of the five sons were born, they named themselves, which is an unusual part of uh, African culture because in most African cultures, either the parents name them or the community names them or a community leader names them or the spiritual leader in the community names the children. But these children, these five sons, named themselves as they were born. Mm. So the first son was named in the Twi language, it is interpreted to be sea trouble. Hmm. The second son was named road builder. Mm -hmm. The third son was named river drinker. Mm -hmm. The fourth son 
named himself Stone Thrower. Mm. And the fifth son was named Cushion. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> These five sons, who all named themselves, were a Nazi's children. A Nazi, as usual, tends to get in these conflicts and these troubles generally by his own behavior, his own actions tend to get him into stuff. And a Nazi got himself into another situation in this event. A Nazi came upon an unexpected gift. He got a glowing spear, this glowing object. He didn't really understand truly what it was, but he knew it had to be valuable. So a Nazi's reaction was to take this gift and flee into the woods to go hide it and save it and figure out what it is so he one day would get some reward from having it. Well, as it turns out, as a Nazi is going through the woods, he is, it's so thick that he doesn't notice he's coming upon a lake. And he falls in the lake. And when a Nazi falls in the lake, he is swallowed by a large fish. I'm sure some of you Bible readers know stories about a large fish mm -hmm. swallowing. All right, all right. Well, this large fish swallowed a Nazi whole. Mm. And a Nazi tried, but he couldn't get out the fish. And then it got darker and later. And towards evening, nightfall, the Nazis realized without help, he was going to stay trapped in the fish. So a Nazi said to himself out loud, whoever can rescue me from this fish, whoever can get me out of this predicament, I'll reward him or her by giving them this glowing spear that I have, this globe that is shining so brightly, I'm going to give it to them as a reward for rescuing me. Well, back in the village where a Nazi's family is, they've had a meal. They're sitting there and their mother goes, you know, your father Nazi has not come home yet. And the children are startled. They're like, wait a minute. And they go, well, what's happened? Where is he? Well, the first son, the oldest son, see trouble, uses his gift, and he recognizes and sees a vision of his father in a large fish. And he tells his brothers, we need to go get our father. He's in trouble. So they all decide they're going to get together and head out into the forest to rescue their father. As they get to the forest, they notice it's thick with underbrush. The trees are tight and close together. So the second brother, road builder, starts to tear down the wood, starts to clear out the underbrush and creates a road for them all to go. And as they go through this new path, they come upon the lake. And they see this large lake and a fish down in there. And they say, oh, well, this must be where our father is. And River Drinker drinks up all the water in the lake, exposing <laughs> the large fish out in the open. And once the large fish is no longer in water, it flops around, it's getting weak, and a Nazi emerges from the fish. Well, as a Nazi climbs out and thinking that he has triumphed and he's happy, a large bird out of nowhere swoops down and grabs a Nazi and starts to fly off with him. Mm. And as he's flying off above the trees, the sun stone Thor uh -huh. takes a large rock <laughs> and chunks it and hits the bird. And the bird lets a Nazi go. Now, unfortunately, a Nazi is above the trees. So as he falls to what almost looks like a certain 
death or at least a traumatic injury, mm. his fifth son, Cushion, moves <laughs> over into the <laughs> back spot that a Nazi was about to fall in and saves his dad from injury. <laughs> but the story's not over. Because now that he is safe, a Nazi tells his sons, well, you know, I, I promise to give a reward to whoever rescued me, whoever saved me from my predicament. And I got five of y'all, and mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm really I'm troubled by the, the idea of how to pick which of you I should reward for rescuing me. First, uh, it's obvious without Citro's vision, he would have. You guys would have never known where I was. Mm. And then, without river build, I mean road builder, you never would have been able to clear a path to get to me in time. And then, without river drinker, the water wouldn't have been consumed so that I could have come out the fish. And without Stone Thor, the bird certainly would have carried me away. And of course, Cushion protected me from any further harm when I fell. So Nazi thought about it, he meditated on it, and here was what the Nazi's decision was. Instead of rewarding one, he was gonna show his gratitude by taking that spear of light, that glowing globe, and placing it in the night sky. Mm. And that night, that piece, that glowing became a guiding light that provides aid and comfort to all travelers through the forest. Mm. Now you say, you know, that's a nice story. It might be entertaining. But what does that have to do with African-centered belief systems? Well, like all folklore, there's always these underlying messages, and there's always these, what they call the moral to the story. Um, even in fairy tales, like uh, Mother Goose, or um, the European Brothers Grimm's stories, there's some qualitative message in the telling of the story. That's why parables are so powerful in the Bible and in other sacred texts. And in this particular story, I'm not going to say that there's a moral to it. What I will share is this. If you look at the highlights of what the participants were about, you will get a spiritual belief system out of it. You will get principles that should undergird our spiritual walk. First and foremost, it would have not happened, it would have not been successful if the brothers hadn't came together. All right, all right. Without the sons working as a unit, yeah. unified in their purpose, it wouldn't have been successful. Oh, and part of that unity was not because one great guy told everybody what to do but that each individual took their gifts and coordinated them in such a manner that the purpose was accomplished. That's piece one. All right. They came together. They unified unity uh -oh. Uh -oh. and collective uh -oh. <laughs> That's another one. Gave them a purpose which they were able to accomplish. That's three of All the right. seven All principles right. of Ngusa Saba. Each, each. And in that work and in that effort mm -hmm. to come together for a singular goal, individuals weren't that important. Mm. What was more important was the unity of the collective effort. And in that collective effort, success and reward resulted, not for the particular individuals alone, not just for that family and that community, but for a greater thing. 
the glowing light became an aid and a comfort to all travelers who came across that path. All right. If you want to look at our African belief systems, then it would directly lead us from that story into the African belief system that we hold so precious. There are three pieces I want to share with you before I close. Mm -hmm. All effective, all spiritually grounded, all holistic approaches and philosophies to life should share three important aspects. They should have morals, they should have values, and they should have principles. Morals are those do's and don'ts, what you should do and what you shouldn't do. The values are how we measure what we do. Either something is a priority or it's not so much a priority or it's not a priority at all. And then the principles, what undergirds us and what is overarching about whatever African belief systems we are engaged in. There should be operating principles. There should be something that explains why and what we do. And in those three aspects, there becomes an outcome. And an outcome should impact us on a holistic level. It should help heal and feed us on a material level. It should also help heal and feed us on a mental, emotional level. And it should touch us and heal us and move us on a spiritual level. If those things are to be embraced, if they truly have a, a measure of worth for us, African-centered belief systems have to compose of those things. That morals, values, and principles, and then the outcome that allows us to achieve whatever it is that our goal is. As an example, there can be small things and there could be major things. For instance, there are people who are engaged in will say who can write well. There are people in will say who have talents in music, talents in organizing material, talents in other areas. Each of them individually could be successful in a Eurocentric view. But what makes it successful in an Afrocentric view is that those things come together for the greater good of the community. The community's outcome is way more important as a value system than it is for individual goals. And the more that our African belief system supports that, the more successful all of us become. It is a measure of our African belief systems that Fortunately, we have already the ancient ancestral wisdom present for us to draw upon. We have born and commit, fed by Kush and Nubia, fostered and featured and grown out of commit into the east of Africa, to the south of Africa, to the central of Africa, to the west of Africa, to the north of Africa, and germinated a powerful spirituality that has been so powerful that it carried across the Atlantic to these shores, and in spite right. of oppression, huh. isms, racisms, yes. and separations, <laughs> still exist today to be a benefit for the community at large. That's powerful, powerful. And when we understand that and embrace that, that leads us back to my uh, favorite position that I'm sure if you've listened to me before, <laughs> the, that uh, when it comes to our sacred ancestral wisdom, there are two elements that I continue to always mention and, and, and speak to. One is the Angusa Saba, which speaks to the daily activities and practices of our African-centered belief system. And then there's the Ma, 
which should be the guidelines that focuses us on how we go about what we do. That's how it becomes a lifestyle instead of an intellectual exercise. Yeah, That's yeah. how it becomes more than just reading something, but actually we learn to study, so we study to learn. And in that approach, we gain something that is powerful for us individually, but is even more powerful for us as a community. If we really want to address our African-centered belief systems, then it has to take on these morals, values, and principles that are imbued in the Aguza Saba and address in the goals of the mob. Right. That if you are going somewhere on mm. this path mm. that has been cleared before you, All right. that then you are rival and your mm. destination mm. will be identified by how successful you are in your lifestyle practice of those same morals, values, and principles. Yeah. And Agusa Saba allows you to look at it on a daily yeah. basis and say, am I measuring up? That's it. Am I doing what I say I should do? Do I speak it? Hmm. Do I think it? And hmm. do I do it? Good. And I would Good. add to that that the Marat is an aim. You should be speaking Marat. You should be thinking Marat. And you should be doing my something active in our daily lives. Mm -hmm. It won't make us perfect, mm -hmm. and it surely will not erase mistakes that we may make or will make, yet it does give us a daily reckoning. So yeah. when we come to the divine. When mm -hmm. we say we're praying, mm -hmm. there's a purpose in our prayer. All right. There's a reason why we take prayer so precious, not for a form or fashion, not to appear so publicly holy, but to always have a way to engage ourselves with the divine. Yeah. And then to be able to come back with all those who are in fellowship with us mm -hmm. and unify for a greater work. Yes, sir. So in closing, I, I just want to say that when it comes to this part of it, I'm inspired. Even though there can be some days where it's hazy and overcast on the outside, mm -hmm. always on the inside, yeah. I'm in the yeah. Yeah. Always on the inside, I'm inspired. Yeah. Always on the inner side, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. energized. I I'm see. moved. I'm touched. I'm healed. Mm -hmm. I feel the power mm -hmm. of those things that all of us have an mm -hmm. opportunity to interact with. I see. So I would say, let us continue to yeah. embrace that power. Let yeah. us continue to be touched by our faith. And yeah. don't allow ourselves to hang on to the Elmers. I see. 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 Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, what a powerful, what a powerful message, followed by a powerful historical tribute, followed by a powerful uh, prayer of justice, followed by some beautiful songs. You know, uh, Minister uh, Malley pointed out that uh, we shouldn't just be uh, satisfied with, you know, just going through the motions, you know, that we are satisfied that we're, that we know about Ma'at and we've read it for a number of years, that uh, we should uh, uh, not be uh, waiting to get patted on the back. Uh, by our traducers and saying, good boy, good girl, you know, <laughs> and, and congratulated. He reminded us how even Malcolm had told us, you need to watch Negroes that are being propped up by the system, that are always being propped up by the system. And he gave us some Anansi, some Anansi stories. You know, my grandmother's name, Nancy, 
and my suspense <laughs> too. So I, you gave me another aspect of, of on their name. So he told us about the glowing spear and how it benefited everybody because everybody used their talents. And that's what we're about here at Walsey Community. Everybody coming together. We have we have lawyers, we have musicians, we have we have people that are engineers, we have people that are doing all, we have elders, we have teachers, we have so many brilliant people coming together. And if you out there that are not a part of us would like to join us today, we ask that you would come forward, speak up in the chat, raise your hand, send an email, send a text, and we will, we will accept you, we will greet you today. And we're extending the invitation today. What a powerful message, Minister Malley. Uh, just when you think he's done, uh, you, you, you know, now he's now he's gone up even higher and, and, and given us something to look at. We, we're thankful for these messages because we can, this is being recorded. We can go back and listen and, and gain and study the message that he's given us. Give thanks today. He gave us a moral, uh, uh, moral values how it needs to help the mental and spiritual. And, you, you know, he told us about how to speak my and do my and think my. Told us there's a purpose in your prayer. You're just not trying to do it for fashion, but to, but to engage with the divine. If you'd like to become a part of us today, we, we extend our arms to you today. If there's, if there's one or two, I see there's 57 participants. But uh, is there one that would like to become and join, be a part of that new members process today? Won't you come? He told us that he has two elements. The, the seven principles of the Nguza Saba. Do you like that, Minister Makalisi? And then he also said that Ma'at guides us on the focus of what we do. We need to learn to study and study to learn. And that's what we're about here at Wose Community. All right, I'm not gonna beat you to death. Oh, Bill. <laughs> Bill, he found the story, he put a link up there to announce it. This whole service today has been uh, a blessing. Uh, 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 an energizing uh, time to come uh, to, to be with like-minded, souls to be with like-minded sisters and brothers and uh, we're thankful today that they are that they are here and that, that you are here and that you have joined us and now if we could all join hands mm -hmm. together and now to them who's able to lift us up faultlessly before the throne on high may they empower us to be a people with one aim one aim one, aim. one vision one vision. One destiny. One destiny. One heart. One, one God. Heart. One God. Let us call upon the name of that one God as our ancestors and elders have done for countless generations, for time immemorial. Let us all say together. Amen. 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 Amen.